<laughs> All right, hi everybody. Uh, so yeah, we're here to talk about uh, a tool we built for uh, yeah, Kubernetes cluster security. Uh, my name is Vincent. And I'm Valentine. That's Valentine. <laughs> uh, so I'm uh, currently working at OpenBook as a hacker in residence. Uh, we're a social media company who, who aims to replace Facebook in the future. Um, I know how to quit Vim, and I'm a really avid Vim user. And uh, hopefully you'll see some Vim prowess during the talk somewhere. So my name is Valentine Marais. I uh, work at the KPN Red Team. Uh, I used to be on the blue side working for Fox IT and Adyen in the Netherlands, and uh, now I've come to the dark, I mean, red side. Um, I know how to quit Vim, but I prefer to use Nano. And actually, this is my first talk, so bear with me. I'm a bit nervous, so uh, I hope this goes well. So now the outline of the talk. Uh, first, we do a little bit of introduction. There is a lot of uh, Kubernetes nomenclature we will explain. Uh, then we'll talk about the several attacks that are possible in Kubernetes. Uh, then we'll show you our logging architecture, basically how to use uh, Fluent, Elasticsearch, and uh, Kibana. Uh, then we'll talk about the traces you can see in the logs when we do certain attacks. And then we'll show you around the alert system, the security dashboard, and uh, do some demos. Unfortunately, no live demos, because uh, some stuff with networking was quite hard to mimic. Uh, so we have made some, uh, some recordings. Um, oh, wow, that's really sensitive. So what is Kubernetes? Well, Kubernetes is a container orchestration tool. Uh, it's, it's written in Go mainly, and in 26, 2014, it was uh, released by Google. Uh, it's now part of the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and it usually uh, runs with Docker. Uh, also, Kubernetes is uh, number two on the most active uh, GitHub repository, with uh, the Linux kernel, of course, uh, being the absolute number one. So that means it's uh, a lot of ongoing development, it's a very alive project, and uh, it's also the I think the most well-known and the most used container orchestration tool that's currently around. Um, with Kubernetes in 2014, there was not a lot of security in place. Uh, when I was doing a red team exercise at, the, at KPN, I found on the internet an exposed cluster in 2016, and every API call I made to that API endpoint was admin. And that's because in version 1.9, they mandated use of uh, role-based access control, which basically applies the authorization to the cluster. And there also, was also a problem with the Kubernetes dashboard. It allows people to easily manage an interface with the cluster. And if it was exposed to the outside, just logging in also meant you were a cluster admin. Uh, but they changed a lot of things, and nowadays it's a lot harder to do that. And they used to have, and I see a lot of uh, clusters have this, they have plain text secrets in the etcd, and etcd is basically the secret manager of the cluster. And since version 1.7 and uh, version 3 of etcd, which is built by CoreOS, you can also encrypt the secrets, which adds another layer of difficulty for attackers. So, uh, for people who have no experience in Kubernetes, we have prepared a nomenclature table for you. Um, so, uh, this is basically copy-pasted from the Kubernetes website. And these uh, terms are going to be used in the talk, so we're going to talk about nodes. Uh, so a node is a worker machine in Kubernetes. Uh, secrets, these are files or a set of files that contain authentication tokens, credentials, SSH keys, everything that you need to keep secret. Uh, namespaces, uh, basically a Kubernetes abstraction to support multiple uh, virtual clusters. Um, and a pod is a set of running containers in the cluster. And a container, I think everybody knows this, is basically an executable image uh, that contains software uh, and all of these dependencies. Uh, the kubelet, uh, which is an agent that runs on nodes and makes sure that containers are running in a pod. Uh, kubectl, or kubecontrol, uh, which is a command line, tool, command line tool for communicating with the Kubernetes API server. And a daemon set, which uh, is something that ensures a copy of a pod is running across a set of nodes in a cluster. So this is an image of a basic cluster with uh, two nodes and one master node. Uh, inside the master nodes, there are a couple things happening. Uh, there's always a kubeless scheduler, a uh, kube controller, and also etcd is in there. And it also hosts the main Kubernetes API. Uh, the, node must, the nodes communicate with the Kubernetes master API, and all the authentication goes through the actual uh, master API. Uh, the node communicates with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the containers, and of course, the, the kubelet node makes sure, uh, needs to make sure that the containers are alive. And if I was to try and spawn a pod, it goes from the master uh, to the kubelet API. So there's, there's a lot of proxying involved. So the arrows are actually uh, proxying two requests uh, back and forth. And that's also where the, the latest uh, CVE came from. Uh, so now we talk a bit about why we are here. Yeah, so what are we exactly doing here? That's a question everybody asks, but you know. Uh, so we are here to present a monitoring tool. Um, so this monitoring tool, uh, in order to build it, we configured a logging architecture for uh, Kubernetes uh, to store audit logs. 
Um, and we performed analysis on these logs to detect and label uh, specific events, it can be malicious events or uh, basically events you want to, to keep track of. And uh, we created a security dashboard uh, for Kubernetes, which, we, which you will see in a bit. So the reason why we created this is because uh, we couldn't find any explicit resources online on how to audit Kubernetes. And there were no tools uh, available to label activity in your clusters to basically have visibility over your clusters. And there was no security dashboard like the one we created. So this is why we're here. Uh, so there are a lot of attack methods for, for Kubernetes, and we're going to run through a couple of them, but there are probably a lot more and a lot of more incoming because Kubernetes security, uh, I think, kind of got a, a kickstart. Um, so one of the common things that is actually possible on a lot of clusters is that it's possible to create a pod in privilege mode. Uh, when you create a pod in privilege mode, it basically gives you the same right uh, to mount block devices as if you were on the actual node machine. Uh, and if you run it as root, then you can basically compromise the entire node. Um, and from there on, you can also get to the master. Uh, another one is creating pods with a host path. A host path means you want to mount, uh, share uh, a file, yeah, a directory uh, on the node. So let's say you do host path uh, root, you can actually mount the entire root file system of the node. Um, other attacks are abusing privileges, uh, privileged pods. Uh, at times you can, um, you can maybe get a code command injection in a pod that's enabled as privileged, or you can also start abusing and stealing tokens. Maybe there's a path reversal, which allows you to get the Kubernetes token, and then maybe you can use it to log into a dashboard. And there are also some methods of this, this deploying some default configurations. In some cases, even, there's an unauthenticated uh, master API where you can just basically send to the API, uh, execute a shell on this command, and you obtain a shell. But there are like endless, uh, endless possibilities. Um, there we go. Uh, this is the first, the first YAML file. If you are willing to commit to uh, going with Kubernetes, then you're going to write a lot of YAML, because uh, they love YAML. I don't love it that much. Um, but this is, for instance, a, a privileged uh, YAML file that spawns the pod into a privilege mode, and which allows you, of course, to compromise the node. Um, the second one is a host mount. Uh, here you can see in the highlighted area that we mount the path which is basically the root of the, of the node into the root folder. So when we would uh, apply this, uh, this pod, um, then we can mount indeed the file system. And if we're running as root inside the pod, then you're also root on the node, uh, which is uh, quite interesting. And that way you can add reverse shells to cron jobs. You can put authorized keys in there. You can put your user into sudo, remove the root password. Uh, possibilities are truly uh, endless. Um, so now we talk a bit about our logging architecture. Uh, we're using Fluent. Um, oh wait, no, first we need to enable audit logging. So in Kubernetes, uh, every, there's a Kubernetes API server uh, where all the, the requests are routed through, and you can enable uh, audit logging by appending the following lines to the configuration. Uh, this basically tells Kubernetes to, to start auditing and save everything in a JSON file. The JSON file is very verbose. I'm going to say this a couple more times because it is truly very verbose. And what you also need to do in this case is you need to create a host mount to var log on other nodes. And then you can just, the, the Fluent configuration will actually get uh, the log files from this uh, directory. Um, we will post, after our talk, we will post our configuration files and point it to our GitHub so you guys can have a look at how it's, uh, how it's done. Uh, as you can see, the logging is quite verbose. <laughs> I had to omit a lot of lines to make this fit. Uh, but it even caches requests and responses, so you can actually see what is allowed, what's not allowed. You can see the status of everything. Um, and it's, yeah, of course, a lot of YAML, and it gets converted quite easily uh, to JSON. And yeah, as I said, it's, it's very verbose. Um, so how do we log? Well, we use Fluent. Uh, Fluent on the website has a configuration for you. Uh, it's also a YAML file, which you apply to your cluster and automatically downloads a Fluent container. Then you just need to point it to Elasticsearch, uh, tell it where the logs are, and it will start streaming the logs to your Elasticsearch cluster. Um, but it also is it's a, it's a daemon set, which means that if you have like 50 nodes in your cluster, you apply the Fluent daemon set, which means it will create on every pod, uh, sorry, on every node, uh, your, your Fluent pod. And this is also great for lateral movement. <laughs> if you are allowed to create a daemon set, uh, you can also use it to instantaneously uh, have a shell on all the nodes. Um, what we also did, because we had to use some uh, extra modules for Fluent, which need to be compiled at runtime, uh, we created an init container. And the init container basically fetches resources, uh, install header files, installs the compiler, and then compiles the gem uh, plugins. And then when the init container dies, um, everything is compiled, and you don't, the tools are not left over in the container. 
And we used Elasticsearch because Elasticsearch is quite flexible, it's quite easy to set up, and of course it works really well with Kibana. Um, we had some problems though. Uh, if you have a cluster with multiple nodes, what will happen is that uh, the same audit logs will be pushed multiple times at some point. Uh, so you need to create like a, a unique constraint so you don't get collisions and have Elasticsearch complaining about duplicate entries. Um, we're not the first one that has this problem actually. <laughs> there are a lot of people. There are also some variations that happen in the, in the, in the Elasticsearch mapping because sometimes the request object and the response object that you get from the Kubernetes audit logs, uh, they are not the same. So what will happen then is that um, the, when the first response object is uh, mapped by Elasticsearch, uh, it creates this specific me me method of how the, um, how the objects are imploded and laid out. So it's very nice. You can recursively go to your nested JSON. But then when you get another response object that does not match uh, the made mapping, Elasticsearch is, is basically going to stop working for you. Uh, so we, we create one uh, JSON response object as a, as a string uh, to, to work through that. Of course, uh, the, the, the idea of resolving this came from, uh, from that post there, and of course, when you see a configuration files, uh, we give the credit to the founders of this solution. So, uh, to visualize this, um, so we're back at our original uh, Kubernetes uh, graph. Um, so, how it works with Fluent is that you have a Fluent container inside uh, your node, inside a pod, and uh, this container is mounted on the var log in the file system, uh, so it accesses directly the, the logs from the file system. And then um, how it fits in the big picture with Elasticsearch is that this container will communicate with an Elasticsearch instance and we can visualize this in Kibana. And this is basically the, out the output uh, in the Kibana table. Uh, there's much more information than this. So here we have timestamp, uh, user, uh, request made, um, user agents, and method, Kubernetes method. So uh, we have much more information than this, uh, but this fits on the slide, so that's why we truncated it. Uh, yeah, basically that's, uh, that's what you get in the logs, for, in Kibana. So there are some, some traces we can show you around from, from common users. I call them attack traces because when I'm doing a Kubernetes assessment, uh, the kube control binary is a post-exploitation tool. <laughs> it's really awesome. You can download it statically from the website, actually. Uh, here you can see some common API usage. Uh, we have the, the user agent. Um, we have the request URI, the Kubernetes method, and, of course, also the username. Is it there, actually? Yeah, the username is there. Um, in the next one, you'll see people trying to obtain secrets. As you can see, they're, they're mainly being done with the kubectl uh, application because of the user agent header. Um, and you can also make rules for enumeration or dumping of secrets because that's actually what an attacker will do when he tries to let it be moved to the cluster. Um, here you see some ex uh, kubectl exec commands. As you can see, they're all in a get request. The parameters are there. And also here we can, uh, we can see the user who invoked this, even the source IP, so if you want to do some, some banning, uh, we can do that as well. Um, there's one problem, though. Uh, we cannot see uh, interactively executed commands. So a lot of times, what I do, I, I will get a shell, and then we, if you use the kube control command, it will send this request to open bash, then it will negotiate a WebSocket connection, and then all the, all the, the actual shell information, output, input, goes over the WebSocket. Uh, Kubernetes currently has no way of logging that. Uh, but if someone pops a shell on your most sensitive servers in production, then I think it's a pretty good uh, reason to have a look at it. Um, what we also did, because we think uh, privileged containers uh, might be a threat, uh, we created a, a small dashboard item to show you when it's allowed to create a privileged container. So if I create a privileged container, there will be one entry here that says uh, the authorization plugin allowed me to spawn a host escape container uh, with that user. Um, so you can get a pretty good overview of what's currently going on there. Um, and it's a good indication for, uh, for compromise attempts. Yeah, so moving on to the alert system. So because we were able to see this information in the logs, it gave us the idea to basically parse these logs and uh, perform some regex matching and to detect specific attacks. So this is the alert system. We called it Katescop uh, because it sounds cool. And it's basically a helper for, helper for Kubernetes security monitoring and how is it a helper? Well, it makes the analysis of Kubernetes audit logs easier, and it provides, um, it basically classifies these logs as labeled events. So for example, the get secrets or uh, creating a pod will be labeled, so you don't have to look into the request yourself uh, using regular expressions, and it provides more clarity about events because it will also give you information about the where, where was this request made, uh, which pod, which container, everything. Um, and Kate's got the technical details of it, 
Uh, it performs static analysis uh, on the date range, so you can give it, uh, I want this from, um, I don't know, March 12th to April, and it will give you um, a static analysis of the, the thing and put it in Kibana. And um, it can also perform streaming analysis in almost real time, um, almost because uh, we've actually noticed that there's a slight delay for the logs to get into Elasticsearch, so we wait, we make the program wait a little bit uh, in order to be sure that we fetched all the logs that have been generated. Uh, it uses the Python API um, from Elasticsearch, uh, the Elasticsearch client in Python, and it's multi-threaded for extra speed. So this is a nice little graph of uh, Gatescop. So it fetches, so you have three components, the fetcher, the parser, and the pusher, and it uses synchronized queues uh, in order to uh, simultaneously fetch, parse, and push to Elasticsearch. So it fetches logs from Elasticsearch, it parses the logs with a set of regular expressions, and it pushes uh, alerts uh, back to Elasticsearch, so labeled uh, events with a bit of information about them. And this is the logo, by the way. I forgot to introduce it. <laughs> a very it. nice logo. <laughs> uh, so how does it fit in the big picture? Well, it's basically here connected with uh, Elasticsearch and communicating back and forth with Elasticsearch. And this is what it looks like in Kibana. So you have the timestamp description, uh, the user, uh, the namespace, and the pods concerned. Uh, the description shows like pod enumeration of all namespaces, attempt to get all secrets from default, so it provides information about what exactly happened, and additional uh, things like the user, the kubelet, kubectl command is also in there, uh, the, and there's much more information that, that you can, uh, so you can make deductions yourself about the events. But it does have some limitations. So the classification is a one-to-one -one mapping because we're mapping event but regex to event. Um, so we, we cannot yet correlate multiple events, which would be nice in order to detect more complex attack traces. Uh, and the rules that, so the, the detection rules, they're uh, inside the code. So it would be nice to, to be able to add rules um, in some kind of interface. However, these limitations uh, are actually potential for future work and we do plan on uh, extending this. So, which future work? Uh, we could create an interface uh, for adding new rules to make it easy to add rules and delete rules, uh, correlate multiple events to, more, uh, uh, to detect more complex attack traces, or uh, even be able to follow an attacker throughout his mo movements, his or her movements in Kubernetes. Uh, we could actually integrate triggers. Uh, so, for example, if you have a, um, an attack on, on your asset, like it's at CD, uh, which is a very important pod <laughs> container, <laughs> Um, you could uh, basically generate a SMS or some kind of uh, email or message to basically the guy, the guy or girl who's responsible for your Kubernetes instance. And also we could uh, connect the alert system to Kubernetes itself. And the reason why it, this would be handy is, for example, if you see uh, incoming requests that are malicious from a specific IP, well, you could actually block the connection from that IP. So now we move on to the Kubernetes security dashboard, and we're going to present this live. So uh, we're going to pray to the demo gods that it still works. I think first we have a video, but and then we... The... Oh, okay, yeah. No, first it's just the... Oh. Is it readable from the back? Okay, so this is our... Zooming in maybe for the, the guy. Oh. Yeah. Okay, this Ooh, is that's too much. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... Does everyone see? I think, I think that's uh, good. OK, so this is uh, the dashboard in Kibana. So here we have an overview of all the requests that were made across the cluster uh, with the username from where this request originated, uh, the URL, and the user agent, the method, timestamp. And here all the, uh, so we generated some alerts beforehand uh, so you can see what they look like. So here we have a nice little pie chart um, for uh, the different alert types that have happened in your cluster so far. So enumeration alerts is when you uh, try to get information about pods or uh, specific uh, namespaces. Uh, no, just pod. <laughs> um, then execution, so command execution uh, that happened in your cluster. Tempering alerts are basically when you created or, or when someone created or deleted the pods and secrets when someone tried uh, to access your secrets. Oh, phone. OK, there you go. <laughs> uh, user activity, so you have different users of your cluster. You can see uh, which one have been more active than others. All alerts here, so the description, the user, namespace, pod, 
here you can see information requests. So someone tried to retrieve information from this namespace or from this pod in this namespace. Uh, here we have some uh, enumer enumeration of all the pods. Command execution here. Yeah, basically a lot of things. Here an overview of the commands that were executed inside uh, the cluster. So on this specific container, etcd, this is really bad if, you, if someone has command execution there. Uh, the, cube, the different kubectl commands that were executed as well. Uh, how many people tried to get your secrets? Unauthorized, so requests that were made that were unauthorized are also logged. And this one that we already showed about spawning a privileged pod. And we're still playing a bit with uh, the verboseness of the logging uh, because I'm trying to see if I can also catch some, 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 some ODAs in the logs, uh, but we need to apply more logging to different components. So there's a, a bit of pollution in the kubectl commands, usually only are going to, um, to monitor actual users. You will see some service accounts in there, um, yeah. but we'll mainly try to monitor users that actually have those, those, uh, those rights to run kube control commands. So Kibana itself is pretty flexible um, with creating new alerts. So if you're interested in other things, you can even create your own uh, vis visualization. Uh, we have a specific dashboard as well for your crown jewels. So if you have um, specific assets inside your cluster, specific pods that, are, that you really want to keep track of, then you can just uh, create a dashboard for, for this one and filter on, uh, for example, here we created on etcd. So we see all the activity that concerns uh, etcd all the commands that were executed and everything. So, the video? Yeah, okay. uh, we don't have really good video editing skills, so we will show you two uh, sequential videos. The first video you'll see is, uh, someone in the shell uh, running commands on the cluster, and in the second video, uh, you'll see the, the correlation uh, of events in the monitoring system. So first thing that happens here is running get pods um, to see if we can actually get some pods. We're, we'll run it again in all namespaces. And we're currently a low privileged user that is not allowed to uh, list resources at the cluster scope. Uh, the user will try to enumerate a bit more, trying to get some namespaces. And these unauthorized events, they're also feed into the security dashboard, because I think it's very interesting uh, when someone is trying to do things they're not allowed to do. Here you see some very great Vim skills. Um, what we're doing over here is we're uh, setting the security context privilege to true, and we're adding a, a volume amount of the, the root file system of the node uh, into our container. So then we're trying to apply it with kube control. There you go, creating the pod. Uh, we'll wait a couple minutes, a uh, couple seconds, not minutes. Um, and then afterwards, uh, we'll try to get a bash shell into the, con into the container. And what you'll see then is that we, oh yeah, first we check, of course, if it's created. And this, of course, creates lots of events uh, in the security dashboard. And now we spawn a shell with a TTY in host escape, which is conveniently called host escape. Um, and we'll see if we can actually uh, cut shadow file or pass WD, because it looks like we mounted the node. Uh, with the security policies, you can restrict namespaces from creating privileged, uh, privileged pods, um, which will create new security events, which you can also add in the dashboard if you wish. And as you can see here, it was quite trivial for us to compromise a node. Um, oh. oh, that's awesome tool we use to record the desktop. <laughs> uh, now we'll look at the correlations yes. in the dashboard. So we're, ba we're back on the dashboard, and we're basically waiting for the alerts to come in. So there's the slight delay um, uh, from the, the case cup, but there's also because Kibana refreshes every five seconds, so there's also that delay that's added to it. So the first uh, alert was a pod enumeration alert. Um, it, actually, it's already there. And then we can see that uh, um, this command was executed. And uh, basically, the, the user who executed this command uh, didn't have the permission to do it. So you have this unauthorized request um, alert. Now we're waiting for another thing that was unauthorized. Now we're spawning the pot, I think. Yeah. Next step was a, this, a new privileged spot that uh, was created. Yes. So it pops up here, and it should get to the um, to the alert uh, to the alerts uh, overview as well soon. Yes. So it's there, and you can see that it basically got created here. 
and then the next step is command execution. So here you see that bash uh, was open, and it's going to pop up in the others as well. Kibana refreshes. Yeah. Yay. And there you go. And actually, uh, the tool also shows which command was executed. So there are some exploits that only execute one specific command, um, which can be useful uh, to show in the list. But uh, some attackers prefer interactive shells, and then there's not a lot you can see. Also, one thing useful to mention is um, also good for detection is that uh, some commands, some regular Kubernetes user uh, would never do, like would never run ID, for example, in in their shell. Oh yeah. Um, or spawn a shell. Uh, I don't know how that how often that happens. If there are Kubernetes uh, avid Kubernetes users here, they would know. Um, but basically, you could also detect for these commands. So, so who executed ID? When when someone does this, you know that basically there's a really high chance that you've been compromised. Yeah, because the first thing you do when you get a reverse shell is type ID. I mean, you want to know what privileges you have and maybe cut past WD to see who's on the system. So. <laughs> And also, we can apply some, uh, I think, machine learning uh, to it, because not a lot of users uh, will run commands in production. Uh, so you can make, basically, uh, yeah, so with some statistics, you can pretty easily figure out what is malicious or not. So you can find an anomalies like this. Yeah, you could even extend the system to, um, to basically have another system on top of it, which performs anomaly detection on all the alerts you have. So you basically, it will learn uh, what is what do I see regularly, and then Basically, you can uh, do some uh, clustering on the data and see what your outliers are. This is for future work. Conclusion. You wanna? Okay. So, uh, as you can see, Kubernetes is a very cool tool uh, for hacking. But um, since we're not evil and we want to protect the world, then we developed this Kubernetes security dashboard to detect the hacks. Uh, so we built it with Fluent, Elasticsearch, uh, Gatescop attached to Elasticsearch, and Kibana for visibility over your, um, over uh, basically all your Kubernetes clusters and over the cluster activity. And since Kubernetes version 1.13, uh, they have some dynamic logging you can enable. Uh, I haven't uh, played around with that yet, um, but once there will be more documentation available about how to do that, uh, we can do different, uh, different audit logging as well with newer versions of Kubernetes. And of course, we wish to extend and have more future work on the, on the Kubernetes Cup, uh, find more ways to log. Currently, I'm thinking of finding a way to let the kubelet log also into Fluent, so we can enable debug logging and actually see a lot more that's going on there. Um, so yeah, this is definitely a work in progress, and we hope to, uh, to release um, more information soon. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we will release the Git. We'll, we'll make sure that the Nilcon uh, conference team uh, will um, tweet about the, the, the GitHub repo once we have everything live. But tomorrow, we're going to spend the whole day in the hotel room to clean up our readme file, make sure the documentation is, is correct, and then we'll release it uh, as soon as possible. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Are there any questions? You, you need a microphone. Just <laughs> Yeah, so this question is a bit meta, but uh, how are you deploying this uh, KH COP on its own? Is it a standalone binary or? Uh... So actually, we want to make a, a daemon out of it. Yes, we're planning to make a systemd service, but it's basically currently it's a Python application. Uh, you, you, can, you can run it once to perform the static yeah. analysis. So you have different parameters. Actually, I'll show you the, the entry. Oh, Ooh. yeah, a bit of something uh, in there. Hmm. Now you're going to see all my files. Make the font a bit bigger. Yeah. Mm. Wow. <laughs> this should be fine. Yeah. So this basically says uh, run it on static mode from this date to now. And then if you say streaming, it will run in the streaming, but we're going to basically um, make sure that this, this can be run as a system. Uh, and since Kubernetes people like YAML, we're yeah. going to write some YAML <laughs> configuration files. Right.
But uh, yeah, and we also will write documentation on how to deploy the Fluent configuration, uh, how, uh, what configuration items you have to add to the API server so that the mounts are correct. Uh, but we're planning on releasing this tomorrow, and then we'll, we'll let you know what the GitHub repository is, and okay, then you can see how it's any, any reason you didn't write it in Go, considering Kubernetes is written in Go to begin with, and it's better off for multi-threaded applications? And we're, yeah, and things like that. That's maybe for future work. Uh, current, <laughs> we both prefer running Python, <laughs> writing Python, so it was easier to start building this. Okay. But, uh, but, a, but a Go port, yeah, might be useful for the future. Go and YAML, then you're basically in the Kubernetes here. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Any other questions? Nope. Oh, is one in no? Okay, I guess we're done then. Thank you all. Thank you.